focused and try and give you a, a big picture about where what we think the issues that matter for equities in the long term. I'm not sure how many of you have read much about the Merrill Lynch Bank of America issue, but this is a letter here from the New York Attorney General Andrew Cuomo, and it just touches on some of the issues that went on behind the scenes with Merrill Lynch Bank of America. I found it fascinating reading, to be honest, the whole issue of Hank Paulson almost pressuring Bank of America into taking over Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch then bringing forward $3.6 billion of bonuses prior to ripping Bank of America shareholders off. Uh, the whole issue for me was probably highlighted to me, well, there's something wrong here. If ever we needed some incentive for change, I'm not sure how much bigger signals we were after. The pure issue that you know, the Merrill's employees thought it was fine to lose $15 million of people's money and then figure that a fair reward for that was $3.6 billion is something that I, I think probably the American taxpayer and most people should struggle with. with. So what's all that mean? Well, for me it probably highlights that there are some big issues in the system that we probably need to deal with and think about what they mean from an equity investment perspective. The first one for me is this whole issue of credit and credit growth. Why? Well, human behaviour to me is a pretty interesting thing and the longer things that go on, the more that they become part of our psyche. This chart here is basically just showing you the relationship in Australia between housing credit and what house prices have done. I haven't put the correlation on there, but I think you can probably take it as read that the number's fairly high. What's it all mean? Well, clearly people have become very comfortable with residential property as an investment. Uh, they figure it's always going to go up. They're not really looking at the cash flows of the investment as the reason for that. But why is it going up? Well, to me, it's a pretty simple answer. We keep on pouring more credit into the economy, roughly at the rate of two to three times nominal GDP growth in the last couple of decades. That makes people comfortable that prices of residential property will continue to go up. Why do I think it's important? Well, basically one reason, I don't think it can happen in the future. There is absolutely no way at 10% growth, the amount of credit in the economy is doubling the amount every five years. Uh, given that the situation in most of the Western world is roughly the same, in the US, the UK, etc., and we borrow it all from developing economies, I doubt the next 20 years is going to look like the last 20. What's that mean? Well, we've got to think about what the implications of that are for equity investment. One of the other ancillary trends has been the whole issue of globalisation. Putting it pretty simply, the last couple of decades have been about us shedding all of our manufacturing and fixed investment offshore and buying the consumer goods back again. What's that mean? Well, global trade's obviously boomed. I remember talking to Chris Corrigan years ago and saying, when he was running Patrick, and saying, okay, well, he said global, global trade grows at twice GDP, and I said, why? He said, don't really know, it just does. And that whole issue was, I think, again, become part of our psyche. We believe that this will continue because it has. To me, just because something has happened doesn't mean it will continue. And some of these trends about the developing world spending more than they earn while the developing economies pay for it, to me, the probabilities going forward um, that's not going to happen. Not that it's likely to repeat itself. Let's dig down a little bit into some of the equity specific issues of the last year or so. For me, far away, the biggest one is the whole issue of financial leverage. Why do I think it's important? Well, for us, it is the primary risk factor that we think about when we buy a stock. It amazes me that people confuse the operating cash flows of a business with how they're financed so much when they think about an investment. I'll talk a little bit about how we look at risk, but this example here in property shows to me how badly leverage has been used when it comes to equity investment. This chart basically just shows you, well, what 
REITs did in response to the last, the last uh, decade or so. You can see there that consistently the cap rates for the multiple, if you like, that people were paying for property cash flows kept on going down. What's that mean? We paid a higher and higher price for the same cash flows. So the gap, if you like, between the cost of debt and the ungeared cash flows of the investment kept on getting smaller. What did REIT managers do in response to that? They kept on increasing the amount of debt. The lesson from all that, and I think one of the huge lessons in equity investment in the past decade, is that you can change the nature of risk in any stream of cash flows by the amount of debt you put in. You start with the cash flows from a row, that might be a very stable stream of cash flows. You add enough debt to it, you turn it into a high risk equity. And there is no doubt that you, know, you can have BHP's cash flows that might go up and down a lot with no debt attached to them, and it'd be a far lower risk investment than me with very stable cash flows from a road, but so much debt that a tiny change in the multiple that you pay causes a massive change in the equity. That simple theme for me applies to just about every investment, but it's usually overlooked by managers. In the context of the last year or so, the focus on volatility as a measure of risk is probably the other real bugbear that we've had in the, in the market. This chart basically just shows you over the past couple of decades, Volatility between sort of 94 and 2006 fell just about every year. What was happening through that time? The price of equities was going up, so equity markets were performing really well. Generally, the companies within the equity market were taking on more and more debt. So if you like, the same companies as investors were paying a higher price for and they were more geared. But volatility was telling us that risk was going down and down. In my view, risk demonstrably through that time was going the other way. What's happened in the last 12 or 18 months? The exact opposite. We raised $100 billion out of the market, so the same companies that we bought last year now have a lot less financial leverage. The price of those cash flows halved, yet volatility told us that risk was going through the roof. To me, the basic lesson is to say, well, volatility doesn't even give you directionally the right signal on risk, let alone give you a lot of information about it. So fundamental risk, in our view, stems from what cash flows you buy, how much are you paying for them, and how are you financing them. Pretty simply, the basic building blocks of a business and the, uh, and the, the multiple you're paying in your life. What's the lesson out of that? Well, hopefully for me, the Abandoning volatility as a measure of risk should be an absolute no-brainer. It has proven a totally inaccurate measure of risk in the past and hasn't given you a directionally right signal, yet we still rely on it as the primary measure. I probably also observe that investment banks globally use it as their measure of risk too. It didn't seem to work that well for them either. So what's my shopping list for change? probably quite a few things and where do I see the opportunities? The first one is that I think we need to start driving capital towards businesses rather than intermediaries. As an economy, we've got a lot of people like me who spend a lot of time shuffling paper and taking a cut, but we don't have, we've effectively hollowed out the fixed investment part of the economy. What I'd love to see as an equity investor is a far more efficient mechanism of making sure that we could invest in businesses that needed shareholders' capital. One of the other observations I'd make is that we buy a lot of service companies in developed stock markets these days because that's what we do as economies. You know, you look at what the IPOs in the market are at the moment, the car sales, the buyers, they're not capital intensive businesses. They don't really need our money and they're not building new assets. I sort of wish to investment bankers constantly about saying, why not bring us some new assets to invest in? Probably for me, one of the, uh, the best examples at the moment is the whole Telstra NBN debate. 
I, f I find it honestly amazing that we sit here looking at an old copper network that no developing country in the world would consider building, delivering speeds about 50 times slower than fibre, yet every investor in the market is doing their best to prolong the life of Telstra's cash flows rather than sit there saying, we've got an old asset, if we want to stay globally competitive, we might want to think about building a new one. That, to me, is sort of instructive about the mentality that's built up over a long period of time in, in developed markets and something that we really have to get over because if we want to stay globally competitive, in my view, we need to start renewing that asset base. So it's about replenishing and rebuilding assets, putting money into fixed investments so that we can stay globally competitive. There are plenty of other examples in, in terms of you know, desalination plants, whatever. They are difficult assets to fund in the Australian market because we don't have a corporate debt market to speak of and it is still difficult to get investors to put money into assets where the cash flows are long dated. As an equity investor, we love to think of ourselves as long term and we sort of think a lot of our competitive advantage in the market is actually taking a long-term view of investment rather than what the earnings are going to be in the next half. To me, Telstra is the obvious mistake that I and a lot of other people have made in that regard. We fail to look at the actual path of the returns and where the cash flows are going. Thirdly, that whole issue of volatility is a risk measure. I would hope that going forward we can abandon that as a measure of risk full stop. It is not you know, the fundamental drivers of risk are how much the cash flows of what you buy and go up and down uh, and how much leverage you choose to apply to those, those cash flows. The more that we can get our heads around, if you like, that the risk is stem, stems from the, the blend of those two, the more we actually will understand the risk we're taking in an equity portfolio. I often use things like the the private equity example, saying, okay, well, taking an, as an asset off market, adding more leverage, and not publishing the price every day does not make it lower risk. <laughs> what it means is that if you've added more leverage, you should expect a higher return because you've taken more risk. Fund managers, I think, need to get far more transparent about how much leverage is actually in our portfolio because the more we take, the more you should hold us to a higher return expectation. Second last one, I think we need to embrace liquidity and lower frictional costs. I know that this is a, a pretty touchy issue, but I'm a huge believer that listed markets are fantastic. The ability to buy and sell an asset extremely cheaply and extremely quickly and raise the money in three days, to me is a fantastic asset and it shouldn't be given up lightly. The, uh, the idea that that volatility or measuring the price on a daily basis adds to the risk, I find totally counterintuitive. I look at it and think, if I could sell my house on eBay for 0.2% rather than have to pay a real estate agent 5% of the property price, it would make me a lot happier. That, issue of getting your head around, okay, listed versus unlisted is something that I think we need to embrace liquidity, not shy away from it. Publishing the price every day doesn't make an asset more risky. <coughs> and the last one, from a company perspective, and it's something we're, we're really trying to do with all of our investments, is to try and get that incentivisation of corporate executives longer term focused. I think we've really fallen into the trap of both governments and companies not running their businesses for the long term and that is largely a result of the way they're incentivised. Going back to the start, Merrill's to me, the way they incentivise their people is encouraging them to take hugely risk seeking behaviour with a payoff profile that is totally skewed in their favour and away from investors' behaviour, away from investors. That should give us that lesson that we want to change that focus, we want to make it longer term, and we only want to pay people if they're delivering in the longer run. I could speak all day about the shopping list because it's easy to write a long one. To me, 
focusing on the simple things and getting at least some of these things done probably going to enhance hugely our uh, understanding of equities in the future and hopefully make them a lucrative investment. I do think we have now reached a period where um, the worst of the crisis is over, that, that tail risk event where the financial markets just don't exist anymore, I think was a risk that policymakers faced nine months ago, and I don't think that's a risk that we face today. But now I think the new sort of challenge and opportunity is the aftermath of the policy initiatives and what those mean, because there is no free lunch. You can't print, print you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, and not have some implications. You know, you can't run 10% fiscal deficits and not pay the cost for those. So now, looking forward, what we're trying to do is sit back and think, okay, what were the policy measures that got us out of this crisis? That's great. Policy makers should be complimented for doing that. But there are real effects from those policies. They will be felt over the next six months and over the next probably 10 years. And we need to now try to position for how to make money uh, off of those various policies. And quite simply, a large part of it is the developed world printed money and is going to be spending money, higher regulation, higher taxes, is going to change the relative structure uh, of global growth probably for the next at least five years, but I would argue probably for the next decade. We can already begin to see kind of how this relative growth uh, is shaking out. You can see, obviously, we saw a contraction in the developed world and developing worlds were correlated. They did contract, but nowhere near to the same extent. I think one of the ways that we can make a fair amount of money that we've found over, over the years is to play this decoupling, recoupling theme. The markets seem to always believe either it is zero, that the world is completely decoupled and China will grow and the U.S. will collapse, or the market gets in a panic and thinks that there is a there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what happens in every country and if the U.S. goes down, China will implode. The reality is it, it varies over time. But if you can judge where the market is on that spectrum and position a little bit on the other side of that, you tend to be able to take advantage of, I think, some market inefficiencies. Last year, you know, before the crisis really spread, it was decoupling. Then the crisis happened, then it was complete coupling. Everything is moving together. And I think right now the market is thinking a little bit too much about the world moving synchronized. And the reality is there are going to be some big differences. And a lot of those have to do with the structure of economies. Those economies that are domestically led, such as in Brazil, such as in Indonesia, in India, in China, those that really are not as reliant upon trade as a country such as New Zealand or Singapore, uh, those, there will be a big differentiation in how those countries perform. Those countries that levered up and are now going to go through a multi-year process of deleveraging are going to perform very differently. So China never levered up, whereas obviously the US and the UK and Europe did lever up. So that deleveraging process in the US and the UK and Europe is going to take years to unfold, um, whereas China took a dramatic hit initially from the global contraction in trade. There wasn't a deleveraging process, and it's a very different contraction. A contraction led by the global shock probably will last a year, and we're already seeing, you can see in places like China or in India, that the PMI numbers already indicate that they are now coming out of that. But a contraction led by a deleveraging process usually takes a magnitude of three to five years. So it's a longer process, it's deeper, it's probably going to be more painful. So the U.S. is returning to um, positive growth, which is encouraging, but the likelihood that the U.S. can grow at a trend growth rate the same as it did in the past, um, similar to the previous comments um, that were made about how leverage is going to be different and therefore you know, we need to think about the world differently, I think that is going to affect the trend growth that we expect in the U.S. or the U.K. Uh, or the Eurozone. And a lower trend growth has a couple of important implications. It has implications for currencies, it has implications for inflation, one of the things that I think is being missed is that if we lower our potential growth rate in the U.S., inflation is caused when actual growth crosses potential growth. Well, it's great when that potential growth rate is really high because it takes a lot longer for you to create inflation. Well, we've just lowered that threshold. As a result, we're going to cross that threshold much quicker than we did in the past. So there's not only implications for return on assets or currencies, there's implications for for inflation as well. So this differentiation of 
what caused the crisis in different countries is going to have important, important implications. So from our standpoint, we're looking for opportunities, exchange rates, interest rates, sovereign credit markets to play off of, of some of these themes. Now, what kind of sets the stage for a lot of the currency opportunities is probably a much weaker U.S. dollar. The U.S. got away with not playing by the rules because we had the only reserve currency in the world. Everyone had to buy dollar assets. Therefore, we had an infinite funding source, could have irresponsible policies, whether they be fiscal or monetary, and get the funding. Well, the world is no longer going to fund the U.S. with the same abandonment that it did in the past, and we're going to have to play by a budget constraint. We can't run infinite deficits and expect that China will continue to buy our treasuries at low yields forever. So we are going to face some, some significant constraints. Well, one of the things I think important to look at is, is what is you know what is going on um, in the U.S. Well, the Fed's balance sheet. Obviously, the Fed has printed money. This has never really happened before. It probably was necessary to prevent a real draconian crisis, but the reality is we are in uncharted territories. So policymakers are doing things that there's no playbook. That, that not like, well, we did this in the past crisis, so we know what will happen. They have no idea. I mean, this is new territory. Um, back in September 11th, you can see that tiny little blip. So that was obviously after September 11th, the Fed came in and basically printed money for a day. And there was a lot of discussion amongst policymakers where, well, what are the implications for this for inflation? We just printed money. Look at that tiny blip. Now look at what we just did. So if you were worried back then, you have some serious issues today. Now it's not just the actual printing of money, it's the composition. The Fed prints money in a lot of different ways. Well, initially it was a lot of the, that light blue line or green line is the temporary. So these are things that will expire within upwards of a year or three years, temporary measures, guarantees. The nice thing about those is that they don't really have to do anything, just let them expire and they kind of taper off. The problem is not only the, the volume of printing money, but now the composition has changed because the Fed went out and bought treasuries and went out and bought mortgages. And those are long-term expansion of the balance sheet, which are much harder to unwind because to unwind those, you actually have to actively go out and sell a trillion dollars worth of assets into the market in a period where the recovery is tentative, in a period where people are concerned that if rates go a little bit higher, it could send us back into a double dip. People are, some people are concerned about inflationary implications. Very hard for the Fed to then go in and say, okay, here's a trillion dollars worth of securities. See how you deal with that. Um, especially since the buyers um, are probably, we're running into some constraints there. So in the past, it was foreign buyers that bought most of the U.S. Treasuries. Now, actually, it's more domestic buyers because our savings rate went from zero to five percent. So that increased the savings rate, created a whole new set of buyers. The problem is, in order to continue to fund what we are starting to run in terms of deficits, we need more and more buyers. We either need the Chinese to come back in, or OPEC to come back in, or U.S. consumers to go from a 5% savings rate to a 10% savings rate in order to fund all of this new issuance, because otherwise rates will have to go higher to create new buyers. And this is where we get sort of concerned on the other side, is that the printing of money that the Fed has gone through is unprecedented. But at the same time, they're spending an unprecedented amount of money. And this is just the outlays and revenues for the U.S. Uh, Treasury estimating will have probably double-digit fiscal deficits for the next couple of years. So this is definitely uh, in uncharted waters. And you know, fortunate as an American, we're now looking at having tax rates that are probably on par with Scandinavia without any of the services that you get in Scandinavia. So it's a, it's a great deal. Time to move to America. Um, now, what's interesting is that during this whole crisis, there was a lot of criticism about, you know, there was a period where the market was really looking negatively on places like Russia, like, oh, they're going to default, or Korea's going to default, or Mexico's going to default. The reality was Russia's total external debt is 8% of GDP. You know, Japan is over 100%. The U.S. will approach 80%. And if you break out the emerging worlds and the developed worlds, again, you see this bifurcation. The emerging worlds are deleveraging, and the developed worlds are going to have to lever from the public sector because to fund these deficits. So there's going to be, you know, in terms of debt sustainability, who are you more concerned about? Some of these developed markets that are running huge deficit levels, either concerned because their exchange rate may weaken, concerned because inflation may come about, or concerned that the default probability maybe goes up slightly. I think there's 
there's you know, probably more concern in some of the developed world than there is in some of the emerging worlds when you look at the simple debt sustainability numbers. So um, I think a lot of this then, you know, if there's concern about the U.S., and I know earlier this morning there was concern, I would agree with that concern that Europe is in no better position. So when people are negative on the U.S. dollar, you have to be negative against something else. You, know, you can't be negative, you know, negative on the dollar. Well, the definition has to be positive somewhere else. Well, being positive on the euro seems to me a little strange because Europe has equal, if not worse, problems. Um, I think the challenge that Europe is going to face over the next decade is that they followed more of a Japan-style model of going through this crisis. I remember being in Japan in 98, and they still had not written down all of the bad loans in the banks. That's you know, eight plus years after the crisis. And the good news in the US is that the pain was taken immediately, and the write downs happened. By and large, you know, the pain was felt, maybe it's difficult in the short term, but in the long term, that allows you to grow out of it. Europe, because of the structure of their banking system, a lot of it could just be sort of taken, no longer marked to market, put at a crude cost, and kind of just put on the back books, and hopefully we'll work our way out of it. But that's going to make it very hard for Europe to expand credit, because these banks are sitting on a lot of bad debt. And it's very transparent, and I think um, that's going to be an inhibitor to European growth. So, and then you look at the UK. Well, if you're negative on the dollar, you must be positive on the pound. Well, Europe, the UK did everything the US did times one and a half. Um, so the conditions there are just as bad. And you look at Japan. Well, you know, Japan has problems that are somewhat different, but equal in, in magnitude. That is, once risk appetite improves, Japanese investors flood their money offshore and you could see a precipitous drop in the yen. So then you're kind of left with, well, against who? Um, and in this audience, I'm going to avoid the question of against the Aussie dollar, because I'll probably lose, which is 300 people here, I'm sure uh, 300 to 1, uh, it's not good odds. But looking at some of the other parts of the world, and I think this is where those countries that have more of a domestically-led growth model, as I mentioned, kind of the BRICS, the Brazils, they weren't as intertwined in the international financial systems, are in a better position. Additionally, those countries that are centered around or linked to China. Now, there's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, the U.S. dollar will lose its status and what's going to replace it, and there's discussions about new uh, global currency, there's, you know, all of these potential ideas, and I think the reality is no one knows for sure, but what will probably happen is the U.S. will no longer be the only reserve currency, but we will face a world where there are multiple reserve currencies. The euro will be important. I think over the next 10 years, and sooner than people think, the Chinese Yuan will be one of those global currencies. It's not going to replace the US dollar in 10 years, but I think it will take on a greater role. And we're already seeing the building blocks of that happening. And if that happens, there are huge implications for Asian exchange rates. And I think that is a great investment opportunity. We have about a third of our portfolio uh, in non-Japan Asia, just in the currency markets, positioning for this theme. We think about what makes a currency global, what allows you to have, I'm sure I'm not on Africa time, okay? Um, what makes um, a currency become a reserve currency? And there's three things over history. One is you have to be big and you have to matter. Well, China is getting big, it matters. Um, they will be one of the largest global economies in terms of percent of global trade, you know, already beginning to surpass or equal the US. So they're a significant force. Second is stability. You need to have price stability in order for people to trust that if they hold your currency, it's going to be worth something a year from now. So no one's going to hold currency in Zimbabwe because they know it won't be worth anything a year from now. They need to have that confidence. Well, China has now gone through two crises, the Asian crisis and this crisis, with relative price stability and currency stability. So slowly, people are becoming more comfortable. If I hold you on, I don't think I'm going to lose half my value overnight in some devaluation. The third, and this is where China is completely lacking, is in the ability to hold their assets. So you need to be able to hold Chinese yuan assets. But that is just a mechanical thing that will change, and China is already starting to issue yuan-denominated bonds. They are already starting to open up uh, yuan trade finance, and you're seeing the building blocks. For example, you know, it's the little things that set the stage. You know, a Malaysian tool exporter to China used to price all of his goods in dollars. Well, why is he pricing them in dollars? Better just price them in yuan. He takes away an exchange rate risk. He's trading only with China anyway, so why are they going through dollars? So the structure of trade finance is changing. The structure of, I think, the global importance of China's trading. And if we can position to take advantage of that long-term trend, 
well before it happens, I think there is an investment opportunity. And lastly, I would emphasize that I think some of the emerging markets, the currencies were pricing in and are still pricing in a level of distress that is inconsistent with their fundamentals. You know, there was a while where Korea was pricing in a 50% probability of default. Uh, Mexico was pricing in a 100% probability of default. And if you look at the debt finances of these countries, you look at the structure of their economies, probably the market is overreacting there. So I think there will be an opportunity in some of these markets. They've overshot, they've come back, but there's still a long way to go. I think also on sovereign credit valuations, the sovereign external debt out of a lot of these countries is pricing in too high a probability that they actually are unable to make their payments. And if you look at their reserve levels, their fiscal accounts, the reforms that have taken place, a lot of these countries have moved away from the boom-bust cycles that they were in the past. I think Indonesia is a great example. Uh, the re-election, you know, the landslide re-election of SBY in Indonesia on his platform of anti-corruption, on his platform of good fiscal and monetary management, uh, you know, putting in Bodiono as his vice president, who was the former central bank governor, was his way of splitting away from the old gold car ways of the past. It was a very important statement that he no longer needed gold car, that he no longer needed the old military regime uh, and the sort of corruption that went along with that, that he could sever that tie and take the country in a new direction. There's a lot of that going on. You can look in places like Brazil, you know, Lula moving away from this massive spending and inflation spikes and volatility to something more sustainable. So I think as an Australian or as an American or as a Japanese, the idea of kind of going out of one's home country allows you to take advantage of some of these themes, but at the same time, by doing so, really reduce the risk of the home country bias. And I think if the crisis of last year taught one thing, it was that too much investments in one you know, home country and highly correlated assets can be very costly. And I think the lesson was learned you know, around the world. And one of the asset classes that held up very well were global bonds because we had the currency returns, the interest rate, the sovereign credit, the variance of those return series actually allowed us to generate positive returns. You know, we had high single digit returns last year. We have low double digit returns this year in an environment where everything went haywire. So if you want a stress test to see how an asset class will do, last year was a great stress test. And I think um, it proved itself, and it's something that I think people can use to help manage a broader portfolio. Um, and because of some of these big themes um, that position um, attractively, I think it, it can make something, uh, hopefully, that will help people uh, to improve uh, the, the broader portfolio that they run. So those are my comments, and thank you for your time. One of the terms that Michael used a couple of times was uncharted territory. And I must say, when I put together these slides a couple of weeks ago, I was really struck by the fact that we are indeed very much in uncharted territory. The type of crisis that we're facing and still face, and the type of policy response is really unprecedented, not only in size, magnitude, but also the types of things that are being tried. And I must say, in trying to put together the slides, I was reminded of, reminded of one of the sayings when, in a former life when I was an economist. We used to often talk about when forecasting the future or thinking about the future that there are those who do not know and there are those who do not know they do not know. So in, in that sort of context, I, I think we need to be very wary about the fact that we are indeed in uncharted territories. There was another great saying I was reminded of this morning as well when Chris was speaking about the upcoming German elections now after them. German elections, we may well get some more clarity on some of the, the debt, uh, the debt issues that some of the German banks have in Eastern Europe. And that reminded me again of that fantastic military adage about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I think we still face a good deal of these known unknowns and a good deal as well of these unknown unknowns. Having said that, whilst we're in a very, very uncertain environment, there are certainly a number of judgments that we can make a number of things that we can look at, a number of relationships that we can examine to try and give us some idea about not only where we are now, but what the outlook may well be. But I wanted to spend this the first part of the presentation just speaking briefly about, indeed, are we in? Are we in the aftermath? I wanted to then look just briefly at valuations, both domestic and globally, looking at equities and bonds, emerging markets briefly, and REITs. And then just to look at some of the risks that remain, and even if we are, in the aftermath, and even if we are well on the path to repair, there are still some risks 
And one of the major ones, which was alluded to again by Michael, is inflation. Inflation is often, mainly, usually, the most significant variable to try and get your mind around when trying to think about the future and when trying to think about future returns. So are we indeed in the aftermath of the crisis? And without wanting to spend too much time on this, given that it's been covered by a number of speakers both today and in the interest of time generally, it, is, it does certainly seem that, well, clearly things have got better. Credit markets, funding, liquidity, all of these have improved. It is now easier or less difficult, if you like, to refinance debt. But the interesting thing has been the change in the industry structure and how banks now have such, in Australia, such a bigger command over how these refinancing go, how successful they are, and the pricing. Equity markets have certainly recovered. Some markets are up 50% or more, indeed off their lows. But I think it's good to remember that there is change and there is level, which is to say that whilst things have risen a lot, level-wise, markets are still a very, very great deal lower than they were a year or two ago. But certainly there has been some recovery. The economic data has certainly been better across most countries around the world. And Australia, of course, has been a stand out there for quite a number of reasons. But as other speakers have mentioned, final demand, so consumption and investment, moving ahead once the policy stimulus winds back, that is absolutely critical. And sadly, there's not a hell of a lot of evidence that final demand is picking up yet. Even if things do continue to get better, and to be fair, that seems like, if you like, the line of least resistance. It does seem likely that the economy globally will gradually heal itself. But it seems extraordinarily unlikely that we'll go back to anything like the pre-crisis environment for a number of reasons of which we're all very well aware. Regulatory change, leverage, the appetite for leverage, the cost of leverage, and also investor preferences. And I think this will be important. There is more and more preference for transparency and liquidity, clearly, as we move ahead, and that will certainly have an impact on the pricing of securities and asset classes moving forward. So opportunities and bargains, how have valuations moved? Well, the answer is a hell of a lot. Since the middle of March, equity markets, as I was saying, have rallied, as you all know, have rallied a huge amount. As a consequence, the yield on equities has fallen quite sharply. In Australia, the yield on industrial equities, for instance, has moved from 10% to 6%, and bond yields here have moved up as well from their lows earlier in the year. And there is no better guide to the long-term return from an asset than its initial yield. So the yield when you first invest is the best possible long-term guide. So the fact that valuations and yields have moved so sharply has significant implications for opportunity. I mentioned the Australian dollar there as well, the canary in the coal mine. The Australian dollar really is a preeminent measure of investor risk tolerance and investor preferences. So if all of us looked at nothing else, nothing else every day but one indicator to try and get a sense of investor sentiment, let that be the Aussie dollar, our own homegrown currency. It's proven to be, through time, a tremendous guide to sentiment. Just looking then at some of these very, very significant moves in valuations. This little squiggly spaghetti graph looks at price earnings ratios in equity markets, both globally, domestically, uh, and in the US. And I hope you can see, broadly speaking, they've moved quite sharply to very, very low levels early this year, but they've snapped back quite sharply as well. And, and that has meant that from a valuation perspective, so looking at the amount you pay for a dollar of earnings, from a valuation perspective, they're certainly not the bargains across the world that they were. So it's interesting just to look at the reporting seasons in the US and Australia over the last couple of months in Australia more recently. In the US, the reporting season was all about cost cutting to try and preserve uh, cash flow and profitability. In Australia, the story's been a lot more constructive in the sense that the reporting season here was probably veering on the positive side in the sense that the market went up through the course of the reporting season. Uh, revenues have proven to be a little more resilient than most people had expected. And comments across the spectrum from CEOs and other senior executives were generally along the lines that conditions seem to have stabilised, but the outlook is still very uncertain. And of course, a lot of this has now been priced in as these markets have moved so incredibly quickly and violently over the last several months. So, the snapback in share market valuations 
to around fair value is suggested. Whilst there's still opportunity there, it's certainly not as great as it was earlier in the year. On relative valuations, so these are Australian valuations, these are yields on Australian industrial equities, yields on Australian resource equities, and also the Australian 10 year bond. Very, very significant change. I mentioned just earlier that the industrial yield, earnings yield, moved from 10% plus. It's now five as equity prices have risen. The bond yield too has moved quite smartly from around 3.8% earlier in the year to something closer to 53 or 5.4%. Bank bill yields, so yields at the very shorter end of the security curve, have also moved quite a deal, well, quite a deal for bond yields anyway, for, for bank bill yields, for three and three and a half. So a lot of the not as appalling as we feared view has now moved through into markets. So the yawning gap that we saw in relative valuations between Australian bonds at very low yields and Australian equities at very high yields earlier in the year, much of that has now dissipated. But on balance, the yield at prospects for equities look a little better than for bonds domestically. Looking very briefly at Australian property trusts, so listed property trusts, REITs, um, really a poster child for everything that went wrong, could go wrong, um, but things are changing. Capital raisings are, have occurred, indeed, so far this year. The REIT sector has raised somewhere around $11 million, and year end rates have certainly been reduced. The market's coming to price that in. REITs returned around 16% in August. They're up 66%, compared with their March lows, but again, change versus level, they're still miles below where they were at the peak of the cycle. There's some encouraging signs in terms of capital raisings. Westfield, at the end of last month, had quite a significant US dollar capital raising, and the, the yield they had to pay to investors at that time was some 350 basis points, so 3.5 percentage points above the Treasury rate, or the <coughs> government rate. That compares with a yield or a spread of around 5.5%, only several months earlier. So certainly conditions have improved there. And that, that has flow through effects in all likelihood for prospects for the unlisted property market as well. And it does seem likely that if not now, in the near future, the worst probably behind us in terms of what's going to be faced by the unlisted property market. But, and it's a big but, there are a number of key variables. That will depend on banks and the lending stance of banks. That will depend on ongoing developments in alternative sources of debt, a la the capital raising by Westfield recently, and also depend on transactions. As I'm sure a lot of you know, most of the transactions in the market of late have been for relatively small parcels of property, and there haven't really been any above the $100 million, $100 million mark. For, for private equity and infrastructure, I think the outlook here will be coloured in part by this move to simplicity and transparency. For many investors, that means a move back to, to listed assets. But what does that mean? Well, that means that a lot of the opportunities will be left in the other areas where there isn't the investor focus. So it seems to us, going forward, there will indeed be quite a deal of opportunities in some of those unlisted areas as a lot of investors move back towards the simplicity and transparency, or relative simplicity and transparency of listed sectors. Emerging markets, another, another area that's been an area of debate, and this has been allied to the issue of debt and indebtedness and the retrenchment of debt or the deleveraging and so on and so forth, that we will see much more powerfully in all likelihood in developed markets rather than emerging markets. So there is a view and there's a lot of thought about whether or not emerging markets should re-rate, i.e. sell for the same price as developed markets. Interestingly, through the course of this year, it was emerging markets that recovered first, and one stage, the pricing on emerging relative to developed markets was very, very similar. I'm sure we're all well aware of some of the reasons put forward for why emerging markets should be rate and why emerging market returns should be as powerful, if not more powerful, than developed markets. Issues like demographics and the infrastructure spend and so on and so forth. Now, I'm certainly not an expert, Michael is. The only thing I would suggest in this regard is that higher growth doesn't mean a higher return on equity or indeed higher earnings. And I think the Chinese market and the Chinese environment is a classic example of that. 
And of course, emerging markets, they, they differ wildly across the spectrum. But by and large, for an emerging market with a current account surplus, very little in the way of indebtedness, so very little in the way of deleveraging that needs to occur, you'd have to say the prospects look quite reasonable, particularly compared to some of the developed markets where they have significant issues of deleveraging and demographics. So there may well be reasons for some of these markets to re-rate a little relative to developed markets. What are the risks though? I began by saying, well, we're not even sure, well, I'm not even sure whether we're in the aftermath of the crisis. But on balance it seems that we are, but there are certainly risks. An economic and market double dip is certainly one that people speak about. So this is allied to the fact that whilst the economy has been on steroids through monetary and fiscal spending, when and if and how powerfully will the private sector pick up and run with the ball, if you like, and it's still not clear when and if that will occur. It's most likely to occur, but still not, not clearly occurring. As well, the other risk is that markets just simply extrapolate the recovery way beyond the actual pace of recovery. So to date, the economic recovery has really been all about the ending of cutback in inventories. There's been, as I've said, harped on about not a lot in the way of private demand. So there's clearly risks there that we could double dip. We've spoken about these, we've spoken about news. No one's mentioned the bathtub, we could even do the bathtub curve. Because <laughs> clearly the environment we're going into will be different to the previous one, and it seems extraordinarily unlikely that we're going to do the thing. Another risk is this exit strategy that some have spoken about today. We're really in the midst of a grand experiment. This quantitative easing, the magnitude with which central banks are buying not just public but private securities, the type of securities they're buying, and the size in which they're, they're buying is, is truly unprecedented. So the significant risk allied to whether or not central banks and authorities in general exit, which is to say claw back that stimulus too early or too late. They do it too early, that of course increases the risk of the double debt. They do it too late, that increases the inflation risk. And just finally on this issue of inflation, it seems to us that the outlook for inflation is extraordinarily uncertain. The near-term scenario seems very likely to be one of continued downward pressure, as we've seen around the world. So what to do? What to do? The type and the cause of inflation is critical to what you think about and how you actually engineer some measures to protect or mitigate the risk of inflation on a portfolio. If, if the inflation is driven by demand, a la China, and its impact on growth and so on and so forth, the impact of those types of inflations tends to be less negative than, say, a supply-driven inflation. The time period as well over which the, 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 the hedging you require or the mitigation of inflation risk is also important. It's also worth pointing out, I think, that shares are not always potentially against higher inflation. We're likely to see more focus, if indeed we do move into a more inflationary environment, of the difference between real and nominal assets. The only catch is for the unlisted sectors, a lot of this is relatively new in the sense that we don't have very long time series of their price performance, but it seems, and it's very asset specific and deal specific, but it does seem that in a number of these types of assets, there should be quite good inflation hedging attributes. Inflation hedging attributes. So just to try and tie it all up, the outlook is still extraordinarily uncertain, but the line of least resistance does seem to be up, slowly up. Maybe the U, maybe the bathtub curve. When we do get back to the new normal, as some has described it, it'll be different to the old normal. Market valuations have already moved to price a lot of this in, so if we were talking about this in March, when it looked like the sky was falling, there were clearly more opportunities, certainly in listed markets then. But maybe the opportunities will now be where investors are not looking so carefully. And this inflation risk, we think, needs a deal more, a deal more consideration. But as I say, it's not priced in. People are quite, people expect quite a benign outlook. But it seems to us that it may well be benign. The uncertainty surrounding inflation is greater than it's been for a very long time. <coughs>